Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's MIT Press live event. I'm Hannah Nyron, Digital Marketing Manager at the MIT Press, and I will be your host. So today we're speaking with Alexis Boylan, author of Visual Culture. Hi, Alexis. How's it going? Hey, how are you? Good. Great to be here. Thank you. And thanks to everybody for logging on and listening. I know that we all, uh, Zoom time is precious. So thank you. Yeah, we have to limit our hours these days. <laughs> yes. So um, to start off, Alexis, could you introduce yourself briefly? Sure. sure. I am an associate professor of art and art history and uh, with a joint appointment in Africana Studies at the University of Connecticut. Um, I am also currently the acting director of UConn's Humanities Institute. Um, I am, as you noted, the author of Visual Culture. Um, I am also the co-author of a book about um, Mad Max Fury Road called Furious Feminisms that came out earlier this year. And then also the author of Ashcan Art, Whiteness, and the Unspectacular Man. And then I've also co-edited two books, um, one about the uh, controversial artist Thomas Kincaid, and then one that's forthcoming actually this winter um, about portraitist, 20th century portraitist Ellen Emmett Rand. Thank you. That's such a great list of books. I uh, want to make sure I focus on this one because now I want to read all the rest. You know, you're not supposed to love any of your children anymore um, or less, but um, I'm really excited about visual culture. I, um, it was like a blast to write and um, yeah, I just think it's a really fun book. So, but you know, I love all my children the same. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, speaking of visual culture, how did it all get started? What inspired you to write the book? So, um, it, Hannah, a little like behind the scenes, Hannah gave me sort of some of the questions ahead of time. And I laughed at the idea of inspired because um, to be perfectly honest, uh, 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 I was inspired to write the book because I was approached to write the book by MIT editor Victoria Hindley. Um, and I have to admit, at first I was a little, um, uh, I, I was hesitant about the, the, the idea. I didn't really, the visual culture so big and, and what would I have to say? Um, but Victoria is just magical. Um, and she said, listen, just why don't you look at some of the essential knowledge series and, you know, just, just sort of think it through. And um, it was great. I mean, I, I really, I love the essential knowledge series. I think that increasingly, I think it's just an interesting turn in publishing um, for all kinds of reasons. I mean, I love sort of quite honestly, the small size, um, the really focused attention on these really complex subjects. And I think it also just really nicely fits this problem that I think we are all having of just, there is so much information, we cannot be experts on everything, but we just need new ways of getting information. And um, so the more I sort of read a couple of the Essential Knowledge series, the more excited I got about being involved with it. I also think that I have become just in my own work with the Humanities Institute and also just with some working with museums and curating shows, um, far more committed and interested in public dialogues about the humanities and arts. I think that um, uh, there is a real importance, particularly in this historical moment, um, for people who are interested in ideas to get out there and open up the field of conversation, um, to try to create as inclusive an audience as we can. So, um, uh, I will say that what inspired me first was Victoria, who can do anything, who is magical, who is just, you know, um, uh, who saw the book in a way that I think um, I was able to then also visualize and push through and write. Um, uh, so yeah, that's it. it. I would say there was a person who inspired me, maybe less than uh, 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 than than just a desire at first. I had to get a little a little little more into it to realize that I really did have something I wanted to say. I had something I wanted to do with this book, so. That's, that's a sweet story, <laughs> giving uh, Victoria the credit for the awesome book. 
Well, I think, you know, I think it's important, I, I think in moments like this also to just acknowledge that like a book doesn't get written. I mean, I wrote the book, but there's like a ton of people at MIT, there's editors, there's colleagues. I know there's a ton of people out there right now who really helped sort of do put all of this together or have ideas. I worked with amazing artists actually in getting some of the images together for the book. So no sort of like inspiration is also like a daily thing with all of the people that sort of come together and are like, you know what you should talk about? You know what you should do? Think about this. So um, a book comes together, I think, in a much more collaborative way than sometimes we, we even maybe personally understand. Yeah, and don't forget the book designers. I know you really like the cover. Oh my gosh. I, I'm just going to sort of show it off. I love the cover. Um, and the cover was a hotly debated item. Um, uh, there's a lot of colors in the world, um, as you all know. Um, and so we had to find exactly the right visual culture. There's also a lot of eyeballs. And so we had to go through a lot of eyeball um, uh, uh, configuration. But again, I mean, the whole MIT team was amazing to work with. And I think, and I, I, as I said, I mean, I just actually love sort of the physicality of the book. I mean, obviously, I am a visual culture specialist, but there is something that's really, I think, nice about the way that these books have been designed as a series. Um, uh, and it's really something that's conducive to allowing people in to thinking about new ideas and new topics. Yeah, I think it really is too. And I think it sticks out. And that's uh, a good thing for this kind of book, for this topic. So speaking of visual culture, what is visual culture? Can you tell us a little bit about the concept of visual culture and what it means to look Sure. Before? I'm going to do the like super, um, not, it's not very stealth when you're doing it on Zoom. Um, <laughs> it would be more stealth if we were like, you know, in real life or in person. But I'm actually just going to read quickly a paragraph um, that I think sort of neatly can get us sort of started thinking about, about, about what visual culture is. Visual imagery swirls around us. Some of it is invited, but most of it is not. All of these visual objects, the additions and the things omitted, create a visual environment where all the little pieces that we see, colors, animals, the moon, skyscrapers, stop signs, political flyers, Kim Kardashian West, all become, number one, legible. Number two, naturalized, normalized, and made obvious. And three, mapped and accessible. How does this happen? And then how do we live and move in our visual environments? How do we confront new objects? And how do we interrogate them and integrate them into the lexicon of images that we already know? And so I think that sort of sums up both what it is that visual culture, the sort of like parameters of what visual culture is looking to speak to, and then also the personal impact that our visual environments have on us. I mean, this is a language. It is the way in which we communicate with each other. It is the way we learn about what the world looks like, what other people are like, what other places are like. Um, uh, and yet, I will say, I think that also visual culture then is so, um, uh, uh, it can be so tricky and it can be so deceptive that we are also often made to sort of imagine that it's, it's normalized or that what we're seeing is just real or that it has not really been constructed or manufactured for us. So I think that visual culture is the sort of broad study of both what we see and how we understand it. And then also what we don't see what we aren't allowed to see, what we actually can't see. Um, you know, it's always interesting to think about how quite literally every animal has different kinds of sight perceptions and how that radically changes how, you know, any being understands what, what is around them. Um, so again, I think that visual culture broadly is a sort of both all of these visual environments and then also um, how we understand them, react to them, how we pull them in, um, how we make them our own, uh, and that sort of thing. I think one thing that people sometimes um, say is like, oh, well, isn't visual culture just art history? 
Um, and uh, I am an art historian, although I will say that most art historians have had um, a real transition in the past 20, 30 years to confront sort of what it would mean to be an art historian and what it would mean to be a visual culture specialist or study visual culture. Visual culture is more interested in all of it and not maybe making such distinctions between what is art and what is not art. Um, art history has a very specific, as all sort of studies and all disciplines do, it comes from a very specific time and a very specific place, as does visual culture studies. Um, uh, but visual culture is more inclusive. It wants to know as much about sort of design elements. It wants to know about graphs. It's interested in uh, math. Um, uh, it's interested in quilts um, and video games and Instagram. So again, uh, along with things that might reside in museums. So it's, it's, a, it's just a broader um, way of imagining uh, how it is that we understand and conceptualize our world. So how is visual culture relevant today? How does it, you know, what instances of visual culture interrupt our daily lives? Well, um, I mean, I think, and this is where I think visual culture can be very tenacious. Um, so right now, like right now, we are looking at um, each other in Zoom. Um, if, we, if, if this wasn't the pandemic, this would not be the frame with which we would be having this conversation. We'd be in some nice hall or some gathering spot and, you know, maybe the MIT bookstore and, you know, there would be, you know, little cups of, of beverage afterwards and there would be this whole other sort of um, uh, series of images and events and performances that would accompany that. Now we all increasingly are getting used to seeing each other in these little frames, in these little boxes. Um, uh, we are starting to think about ourselves, you know, often the joke is like, you know, we have no more legs. We are just this sort of, you know, floating torso. Um, that affects how we understand our relationship to other people. It affects how we think about ourselves. Um, uh, I have probably not given as much thought to what I look like when I talk as I have in the past couple of months, because of course, I usually don't see myself when I am talking. I'm just a person and I'm talking and then I see everybody else. Well, Zoom rearranges our sense of corporeality, our sense of who we are, our sense of who you are, Hannah. Like, my having this conversation with you is completely interrupted by this visual framework that we find ourselves in. So I think the first thing to say is that, and of course Zoom is tricky because it wants us to think that this is easier or this is natural or that this is you know, somehow cohesive. So again, I think visual culture is often difficult to pull out and think about because it feels like it's second nature. It feels like it's obvious. It feels like it's just what's around. Um, I think what's important about visual culture is a couple of things. First of all, I think we all need to be a lot more aggressive, assertive, and empowered in thinking about what we allow in to our visual world. Um, uh, there are a lot of corporations, there are a lot of governments, there are a lot of very powerful entities, not to become all paranoid, but um, every day you are accosted, quite literally, by thousands of images that you didn't ask for, um, that you don't have control over. Um, and uh, I think we all need to become a little bit more assertive about deciding what we want to let in and what we want to keep out. I also think that we all need to become a lot more aggressive and assertive about what's being kept away from us. Um, you know, we think that when we're on the internet, for example, that we can find any image. Um, but you know, no, that's not true. And if you do a Google er image search, it's a million algorithms that are, it's not a million algorithms, it's, it's algorithms that are deciding what you probably want to see what you have looked at in the past, what kind of things other people have paid to bump up in the sort of list of things you see. Um, so again, I think we have to become far more aggressive 
um, as both sort of people who take in visual images and also we need to be far more aggressive about looking around and saying what's been missing what ha what am I not seeing what is being hidden from my view and who is hiding it and what do I need um, uh, to to again become more of a active agent in our visual world. Uh, there's tons of people whose whole job it is to control what you see every day. Um, and I think that it is increasingly urgent for us um, as professors, as um, citizens, as just people wandering around in this particular historical moment to become a lot more, I don't know, aggressive about what you want to see and what you don't want to see and who's making you see what and what power is behind that. Yeah, and as a digital marketing manager, I probably know a little bit about <laughs> how that gets selected. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I think there is also pressure on people who are serving up this information to make it more valuable to audiences because it's there's so much information being thrown at us. Uh, absolutely. Information. absolutely. I mean, the same pressure falls on everyone who is creative, which is that how do you get what you want seen? Um, it, it amps us all up. Um, uh, I think particularly, I mean, the technology, there's no denying that the technology has both increased um, sort of the, the monetary, certainly, um, uh, impact of being seen. Um, but I think also there are, our economy, it pulls so many of us into these sort of circles of visibility that we didn't maybe have access to, that weren't particularly urgent. Um, you know, I mean, just, you know, with the MIT book, it was, you know, what is your Facebook? What is your Instagram? What is your Twitter? And none of that is done with any nefarious, you know, like, again, I want everybody to read the book. It's a great book. It's a really helpful book. But everything becomes implicated in these systems, which are about, you know, getting some face time, getting some visual recognition. Um, and we are all being increasingly forced to, uh, to perform in this new visual marketplace in ways that are often also just not a good fit. Um, uh, you know, I think uh, in many ways, you know, I think, this is part of the, the crisis of sort of higher education, um, which is, you know, I don't see what you're getting out of this. Um, uh, and again, that, that idea of sort of sight and value is so sort of crucial and those dialogues so fundamental to really sort of think through. Yeah, definitely. So um, what are some other current events that have either affected visual culture or been affected by visual culture? Well, I mean, you and I were talking about this, um, you know, of course, Zoom, which we just sort of discussed. And I, I really kind of, I mean, I do think that, um, I think it should give all of us pause to think about how much education now, um, particularly for children, is happening through this software that has this very specific visual application. Um, and I do wonder what impact that's going to have on communication, on ideas about power dynamics, on sort of, you know, I mean, just even the very idea of like who's muted and the little microphone that won't let you talk, um, uh, I think is all changing um, and ways that we won't really understand for a number of years, sort of how we understand also corporeality. Um, uh, what, what does it mean to be present? I think are things that we're going to have to visually um, uh, change. I think one of the other things, of course, is uh, quite literally just, and I'm sort of keeping with the sort of what is what is in the news this week and what are we thinking about, but just thinking about actually the way that the coronavirus has been visualized is fascinating. Um, and so many people think that when they see the big red um, ball that has the, you know, the white sort of uh, 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 sticks, you know, like trees coming out of it, that that's like a photograph or that's some kind of documentary um, uh, 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 image. Um, but in fact, it's actually been amazing to listen to the, the woman who is the illustrator who made that image, how she made the image. Um, and I think it's interesting and I think I'm hopeful about the idea that, that, that 
so many people looking at that image and then so many think pieces about what that image means might get us thinking about other images that are sort of sold to us as scientific or as photographs. Um, in the last chapter of Visual Culture, I talk about, for example, the picture of the black hole um, that came out last year. Um, and the way in which even the people who made the image often talk about it as like a photograph or um, as having some kind of finally we can actually see what a black hole really looks like. Um, but if you really deep dig into it um, or think about it or really sort of puzzle like, well, how did we get that image again? The image is actually a construction of literally thousands of data points um, that have been in some ways by humans um, uh, 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 fixed and then oftentimes also by computers that have decided like oh well these readings don't make sense so let's throw out those data points to create an image that we all can comprehend and um, and that makes some sense to us and so again it doesn't necessarily it doesn't really operate like a photograph did historically it doesn't have the same kind of that what's often sort of presented to us as factual and scientific and analytic is often really far more creative um, and at the same time, I think it sort of makes us need to think a little bit more about all of the creative work that is done in how we understand, how, you know, graphs, maps, um, GPS, you know, again, the sort of way in which we are being convinced of a certain visual culture of authority and truthfulness and science, but how often those images are very much handcrafted ultimately or you know handcrafted with the help of a lot of technology and the technology also is making some decisions about what we can and cannot see um i think sort of finally uh i think about the emerging visual culture of the face mask um uh, i think people didn't really at least in the united states think much about face masks at all um, and now a face mask has and has come to represent um, visually this incredibly uh, divisive political touch point. Um, uh, so often in newspapers now, the photograph will be one that's either focusing on how everybody is wearing a mask or how everybody isn't wearing a mask. And we as readers are supposed to immediately understand the sort of visual meaning of being in a mask or being maskless. And so I think that there again, I think that how that visual culture emerges, how much is unspoken then, um, or seemingly unspoken, made to seem obvious, um, and also visually weaponized. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, who is wearing a mask and who is not, and who's looking at whom, um, are becoming a major part of how we actually interact in public spaces. And again, that's all actually the language and the culture of the visual. Yeah, those are all really great examples. And I feel like most of us have seen those examples in the past week. So it's fresh in our memories. Every day, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, it's embarrassing to admit it, but I'm not afraid to because I do embarrassing things all the time. But I, I, it never occurred to me that that image of the coronavirus wasn't, you know, a microscopic. I mean, it, it obviously had some artistic retouching. I just never thought it was as creatively inspired as you say it is. Hannah, that's perfect, right? Like that's a perfect <laughs> example of, of what I'm talking about and what I'm talking about in this book, which is that's how good the image is at communicating authority, right? That, that, that intelligent people look at it and make assumptions about it and work then and move on based on those assumptions. But again, it's really important to keep in mind, there was an artist who made a lot of those decisions. The choice of which image was going to be the sort of big popular coronavirus image was something that was debated. I mean, again, think about what the visual effect would be, you know, and again, that's sort of, I get into this idea of sort of, you just change around a few colors. 
what if it was neon green with purple spikes coming out of it or you know that all of a sudden it would have these very different associations just based on something as sort of benign and you know, sort of imagined as color. So again, I think that um, you're not alone in that. And I think one of the things that it's important for us to keep in mind is how much of our culture is encouraging us to not think about what we see. Um, uh, that that's actually really part of the story I'm trying to tell is about how many decisions and sort of ideas that we are being sort of just quickly convinced to take on as solid and immutable, but that are actually, you know, I think we need to appreciate how much creativity, how much thought, how much manipulation is going behind the things that we see. Yeah, that's really fascinating. So how are some other ways in which, um, you know, how can visual culture be used to create change? I know that there are ways that visual culture affects us. But how can it be leveraged from the creator end or just from any general person's end to create positive change? Well, I mean, I think, I think it might be more helpful to think less, um, you know, positive and negative are loaded, right? Like, and, and so what's one person's positive is another person's negative. Um, I think that what feels more helpful to me, and I think that what I try to do in the book, and actually what I just try to do as a teacher, and um, uh, just in my day-to-day -day life, is to try to locate my own power. Um, locate my own power to look at something and to make a decision. Locate my own power to also um, choose to encourage or represent or um, promote the vision of things that I want to see and the world that I want to move towards. Um, I think that it's about sort of deciding that you're not going to be a passive viewer of things, that you're going to be more, um, uh, you're going to sort of take on the obligations and responsibilities. I think that's actually going to be our only way forward. Um, I, I think that, um, and, and I think that once, people uh, sort of take on that, that power, that authority. Um, uh, it is both personally empowering, it is personally then, it, it makes the world more vibrant, more exciting, you're more open to things. Um, and likewise though, it also makes you more able to stand up and be like, no, no, I will not, that is problematic. This is why we should talk about why that simply replicates injustice this is what I want to do to make this world different. So I think that um, it's less about sort of imagining uh, a, a zero sum game of like that we could just all of a sudden like somebody will make a really good visual culture or something like that. And instead really thinking about, you know, for artists, um, uh, what are you producing? What are the understandings that you are basing your production on? Um, how could you broaden those? How could you change those? And then again, as people who then are perhaps not makers, um, you know, what is it that is being sold to you? Um, what is it that you are being forced to see? And how can you show resistance? How can you be present? How can you subvert narratives also? I mean, I think one of the things, um, you know, that's actually been really beautiful this weekend um, uh, is to, you know, out of the tragedy of um, the actor who uh, played um, Black Panther, Chadwick Boseman's passing away, I think that there's been also just this like flood of um, images and testimonies to what it meant to so many uh, Black children uh, and, and non-white children to see, to visually see a superhero that looked like them. Um, but I also think that what's so beautiful about that is then how many children, you know, have parts of costumes or paint their faces in their own way that expresses their own individuality. 
that I think that if, if you want to talk maybe not about what is positive, but the potential of visual culture, it is to find yourself, to reclaim yourself, to reclaim your history, um, and also to sort of point out what has been systematically removed or systematically hidden from us. Um, uh, you know, I think that, that, that all of that, um, you know, uh, uh, allows us to imagine a world that is not the one we live in. Yeah, I think that's a really good illustration. And I had my tissue at the ready this time because I, I can't talk about chat with Bozeman without crying. It's totally, I mean, it's, it's, I, you know, I have to say, I mean, I'm just going to, I'll try to get you off of the, the emotion <laughs> of it by saying, I mean, um, one of the things that I think is so, that I love about that movie, I love so much about the movie. I mean, the, just all of it but um our introduction to you know the and again i don't see him as the villain of the piece um killmonger is actually in a museum um and it's with a confrontation with a white woman who is a curator um over an african mask that's in the museum and i actually think that what is such a beautiful sort of testimony of that film is the film itself, I mean, it's this real meta moment where the film itself is actually saying, this is a place that people go to to see themselves and you distort it. That museums are places of distortion and of silencing. Um, and that he, you know, I mean, in the end, of course, it's, it's part of a theft that's going on. But actually what I like is that the potential of changing those museums, that he goes to that place and he wants it to be better. He's pissed that it's so bad. He's mad that it is really a testimonial, it is a site of oppression. Um, and I, to me, that actually is like the hugest and most sort of empowering moment. Like, yes, we all need to go into museums and make them do better. We need to ask better questions. We need to, you know, I'm not encouraging necessarily stealing things, but, um, but you know, I think that there is a place where we have to ask what's actually been stolen and now has ended up here. Um, and, um, and then we look at it as if it's, we're supposed to look at it as if it is not stolen, as if it is not actually a theft of people's heritage. Um, I think that to me that, that movie and that even just like sort of like a throwaway scene, is really about this idea that we have to go to the visual to change the world. Um, this is how we do it. Place by place, movie by movie, museum by museum. Yeah, and I do think it's a powerful gesture to have that character steal back the artifact that was stolen from their native country. I think it's a beautiful reminder of the power of the visual. Like, and about, and about sort of ownership and about who is going to say like, no, you don't get to control me anymore. Um, you don't get to control the narrative through visual objects. Um, and to me, I think it's such a great example of just um, uh, how much I think also power we all have again and just, I mean, I thought it was really interesting how um, uh, on Sunday, NBC decided that sort of the way that they could honor um, uh, uh, Bozeman and his work was to play Black Panther without commercial interruptions and all that sort of thing. Um, which on the one hand, you're like, well, that's all about NBC and da 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 da. And on the other hand, I think it is a symbol of sort of what, what we could be asking our corporations, what we could be asking movie studios, what we could be asking museums, our government um, to do in terms of creating the visual culture that we deserve. Yeah, it all plays together. Yeah. And sometimes big evil corporations can do nice things too. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll, I'll let you say that. Um, uh, uh, sometimes I think we can rise up and make our corporations do better. Um, uh, I, think, I think is how I maybe would phrase it. But I, I hear the desire, right? And I guess that's, that's part of it, the desire to have voice against something that can often seem like very oppressive and very um uh, uh uh very something that really tamps down our potential and in, instead of maybe celebrating it yeah definitely 
Well, thank you so much for sharing all your insight with us, Alexis. Oh, yeah. Um, we have a few questions. Okay. Um, I promised everyone there would be a Q&A, and I'm not going to cut, cut us off without that. Um, but we have about five questions so far. So if anybody wants to ask a question now, go ahead and put it in a box at the bottom. We have some directions in the chat. Um, and I will try to get through as many as I can. We're not doing, um, any audio. We're just doing the Q and A box at the bottom, and then I'm going to read the questions. So Alexis can answer them. Um, all right. So first question, do we, or can we control visual culture? I feel like this was an early question. We got into that a little bit. Um, but what are some of the ways we might come to control visual culture rather than being controlled by it? So also, can't re wait to read the book, Martha Cutter. Oh, hi, Martha. <laughs> um, uh, so I, I think it's about, so I will be, I am not, um, people who know me uh, know that I am not, I don't suffer like from an overabundance of optimism. Um, so they, even when you ask the question about like, what can we do for positive change? I was like, ah, no, don't even frame it that way. But I think that the power that we, there's, there's two things that I think that we can do. Um, do I think we can make our visual culture better? I think we can make it better in a neoliberal system through the choices that we make as consumers. Um, that is uh, perhaps ugly, that is very unidealistic, um, that is not particularly optimistic, but I do think that at the end of the day, I think that the choice to say, I'm not gonna go see that movie, I'm not gonna participate in this, I'm going to block that on my Instagram, I'm not going to participate in this sort of visual culture. I also think that increasingly, um, uh, and I think because of technology, our uh, places that produce visual culture are a lot more perceptive and receptive to people being like, nah, -uh, that's not going to work. Um, and, and I think that it's actually encouraged publications um, to be more expansive, to be more uh, interesting to broaden their reach, to make visible things and people um, that have historically been um, unseen and invisible. Um, I think sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but I think that what we can do as just people who live um, and um, uh, is, is to really take seriously our choices and our obligation when we see something that is just wrong that is just not the way forward um, in whatever way that you frame that is to be vocal about it. Um, uh, and, and I think, you know, it's, uh, I, I think I have been very heartened at the resistance that has happened all summer um, to museums. Um, I, I, I love museums personally. I love going to museums. Looking at art is very important to me. But museums need to change. They need to be more open. They need to be more receptive to the diversity of our culture. Um, they need to think about how historically they've gained power. And um, I have to say, I've seen a lot of pressure put on museums and I've seen museums, sometimes not great ways, but often really sort of force themselves to change and open up. Um, uh, and I, I think that um, that's where potential is in just sort of standing up and saying, I don't have to take it. I don't have to watch it. Um, and just because everybody else is and just because it's popular doesn't mean that I also can't say like, no, and this is why. Um, and again, I think also like putting a little pressure on friends and just sort of saying like, nah, like these are the problems. This, let's talk about this. What, let's talk about what happens when you see this. I actually think that um, we are a lot more changeable than often we give ourselves credit for. Um, uh, and also we are also, I think uh, we can be, um, uh, corporations, I think we have learned, um, and, and also, you know, stakeholders with power, um, often realize how tenuous that power is and can be influenced um, to, to choose differently. That's a 
Great answer. Very thorough. Um, all right, question two. What is the role of typography in your book? How do you integrate typographic history and type technology in the story or picture your book is offering? Well, I will say, I wish, um, I wish I could have done more. Um, I've actually become very interested in um, uh, uh, that history. Um, I will admit it's not something that I uh, spend too much time on in the book, again, because I was really trying to sort of create a sort of more, uh, a, a general thing that sort of gets at a lot of different questions and points. But I think that this relates to some of the ideas and questions that I have about, um, about knowledge making, um, about how it is that we are being instructed visually about what to believe is truthful, about what knowledge is worth ingesting. Um, and I think that, I think it is actually one of the most exciting sort of branches and growing fields in visual culture study um, uh, to sort of take on those um, questions around this central issue of what are the convincing or what have been the manipulated uh, visual vocabularies of knowledge and authority. Um, and and that, that I think, so I get at sort of the broader issues of that, um, uh, uh, but uh, there's actually, and I will say in the um, index in the back, I actually do have a number of books that sort of were selected reading um, uh, that hit on that topic with probably a little bit more um, intensity. Um, uh, it's really interesting and that's a great question and it's a growing field. I feel like uh, whoever asked that question might have read your book and seen the index and <laughs> wants more you know i mean i think that it was the thing um you know i i uh just to give another shout out to my amazing editor victoria henley um you know i mean i think the trick of a book like this is to try to be as broad and inclusive as you can um, but then understand also that there, it's just such a rich field. And what I hope happens is that people sort of read this book and then push forward. Um, and again, so not only sort of empower themselves just sort of, you know, perhaps in terms of confidence or intellectually, but then really sort of push forward into the things that you're really passionate about. One of the other things that I didn't have time to really get into and that personally I am really interested in is sort of fashion history. Um, uh, uh, that's something that I, again, sort of allude to here and there, but uh, that's also, you know, how we choose to present ourselves, what clothing we wear, um, how clothing is culturally understood is, again, a really sort of growing and important field in visual culture studies and, and sort of what I think, uh, again, like topography, like the future of where these conversations are going as it relates back to knowledge and authority. Well, it sounds like uh people are giving you ideas for all your next books in these Yeah, books. or they should go write their own. Honestly, like that's also, I mean, that's like the great joy of this, right? Like I, I want to hear, it's a conversation, you know? I mean, I had my sort of, you know, my say, and now I want everybody else to sort of, you know, get in there with their, with their, with their knowledge and their interests and their passions. So, yeah. Awesome. So um, next question. They said, uh, such a great talk. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I really love Alexis's point about how creative scientific images actually are. I just recently learned that MRIs are not pictures, but rather constructions created from data points. Could you say more about what this means for how we might engage slash critique this kind of authority? So, um, yeah, I will, and I'll tell a super gross, weird personal story. It's not really gross, but um, uh, a couple of years ago, I had to have a hip replacement. And um, of course, um, I was like, well, I want to see my x-ray. Like, let's see it. Like, let's like, let, and the doctor was super excited because I guess a lot of people are like, don't want to see it. And I was like, oh, no, like, let's get them all out. I want to compare them. Tell me about like, what's what you're seeing. Um, and one of the things is that when I had the surgery, um, uh, he, there, were, uh, there's a, there was a lot more bone fragments than were visible in the x-ray. And I said to him, uh, to my doctor, I said, I don't understand. Like, what is it that's happening? Like, why don't, why don't we see that? It doesn't that matter? Like, doesn't that, like, why don't we have the technology to show that? 
And he was like, oh no, like you don't even need, like when I open it, like this is just, a, this is just the most sort of, he said something to the effect of the way he was looking at it and the way I was looking at it were radically different. That I was looking at this x-ray as if that's what my bones look like. I was looking at my x-ray to like sort of see some kind of physicality. And that he was really looking at it as a doctor who was really sort of thinking about it as more of a malleable concept and also then putting together pieces of information that just my visual eye really, I mean, and of course, right? Like that he knows how to read these things. This is his specialty, all that sort of thing. But what it actually just made me realize, and I'll get back to the question now, which is such a great question, is that I was like, oh yeah, like, because he has to be trained to unsee it perhaps my way and see it his way. And that so much of often what happens in science and then what happens in sort of science education is the untraining of seeing it perhaps in a sort of in a novice way to see it in an expert way that makes it seem like that's the only way to see it. And then what science educators have to do is take then that idea and then re-explain it to novices. So that there is this very, com and then in between all of that are image technicians, computer specialists, illustrators. Um, uh, my next project is about the American Natural History Museum and you know just all of the people on staff there who are in charge of creating these visual images that are really sort of um, translations from sort of scientists ideas and their data points. Um, when I walked away from my hip surgeon, what I realized is that this is a whole lot more creative and there's so much more training and untraining of our visual culture than perhaps we've really, really understood. Um, and, and that to me is the interesting question. Certainly how much these images are manipulated, how much creativity goes into it, but also just how certain specialties actually train you out of seeing certain things and into seeing other things. Um, uh, and, and then just also how all of us are trained into seeing certain things and then out of other things. So it's a great question. And I, ha I will say that's where my next book is going. So um, uh, stay tuned. Um, uh, but yeah. I do have to say, I don't know if everyone would see their uh, hip x-rays the same way you do. <laughs> yeah, no, he said, I, I, he was very like, you're actually one of the very few people who is, you know, because I was like, I want to see them all. Let's get them all <laughs> there. Um, uh, and actually, it was very interesting because he was super excited to show them because I think he, you know, again, I think that, that, that we should, a point of real communication um, and, and honestly intimacy is the visual. Um, and so the way that I, I mean, in, in a very sort of basic way, I think sometimes the way, the thrill that I get from uh, talking about an image and having somebody be like, oh my God, I never really thought about it that way. I think he was getting when I was like, you know, sh wait, I don't understand. Tell me more about this and this and this. And I think, you know, again, that, that is how, you know, it, it is often through the visual that we find kinship, intimacy, um, uh, you know, that we create circles of, uh, of relation, um, which is why, again, it's such important work to think about and to also then think about how often the visuals block us off from people and, and, and disallow people the intimacies and the relational communication that they need yeah that's really interesting um so we have quite a few more questions but the good news is we still have 11 minutes <laughs> it's okay <laughs> let's see how many questions we can get through in 11 minutes i'll be shorter i'll just be like yes or no now um, if, if uh we don't get through all the questions is there somewhere where people can connect with you online or something to ask more questions sure i mean they can um uh, uh they can email me at my yukon address um as i said i work for the um uh, my, uh web pages in the art and art history department in the africana studies program and um uh, at the humanities institute and um yeah no absolutely i could talk about this all day long so uh absolutely people should email um if they have any questions 
Great. So with that said, just in case, um, we'll get into question four. Um, Alexis, can you say something about race and visual culture? What are the ways individuals who are racialized can come to control visual culture rather than constantly being surveyed by it? Is the cell phone video helping? I'm not going to say who wrote this. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> because they already asked a question. I don't want them to get a reputation for asking. All right. Okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, I have to say that is, that is if, if, in terms of sort of what my, my specialty is in an academic sense, that is what my specialty is, is to think critically about race. I mean, I think the first thing is, is that it is important to understand that all bodies are racialized. Um, all bodies, um, uh, and that um, uh, it's important to keep in mind that information and learning about white bodies and non-white bodies is a process that begins um, immediately and then is constantly reinforced um, uh, by what, and this is what I mean about sort of the power of what we allow in, what we take in. Um, uh, and uh, I do think that um, uh, we are, that all visual culture is racialized. All visual culture is in conversation with race. I think that one of the things that's been so exciting about the sort of, um, uh, the direction that visual culture has taken is that it has become so broad that it is beginning to truly, um, I, I think, speak to how in fact, racialization of the visual is not a subset of what we're talking about. It is what we're talking about. That we racialize landscape, we racialize um, buildings, we racialize food. Everything that you think you see um, has attached to it um, and is being manipulated to speak to certain bodies, to speak to exclude certain bodies. And along with that racialization is, of course, issues of gender, issues of ability, issues of sexuality. Um, uh, all of us and, and visual culture has been a primary mechanism for cataloging human difference. Um, and then for emphasizing and naturalizing this idea of difference as real, as scientific, as, you know, distinctive. And so I think that it is one of the most difficult, but it's also one of the most important aspects of thinking about visual culture is to keep in mind this idea of it is always racialized. That is the primary sort of vector of how we understand everything about our world. I think in some senses that can be very overwhelming for people. Um, I think that that can be very like, oh no, like I don't, I, I can't win, I want out, you know, this sort of thing. Um, to me, I think that it's more important in this moment to sort of double down on that and to think very seriously about how we see and how what we see and how we choose to see and what other people see is invested in our past racial histories and in the racial histories that we want to tell. Um, I, I think that um, uh, it is very important to put an enormous amount of pressure on museums, on public institutions, on private institutions, um, to speak to representation, to speak to diversity, and to speak to equality. Um, I think this, that is the, to me, um, uh, uh, the primary significant issue of visual culture studies. That's really fascinating, and I do think a lot of people might react negatively towards that initially thinking like, no, 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 I don't do that. But um, I think it's good to be aware of the way that we're wired to think. Well, I think we also have to, I mean, I think that it is a privilege of whiteness to decide that one wants to engage or not engage. That so often um, our visual culture in, it captures, it captures all of our bodies. I mean, I think that's important to keep in mind that all of our bodies are coded. All of our bodies have meanings that are not ones that we created, that are put on to us. But I think that how that plays itself out and the violence that we have seen 
particularly this summer, um, the anti-Black violence that we're seeing has to do, again, with the pervasiveness of a visual culture that constantly um, analyzes, picks apart, dissects, and marginalizes Black bodies. Um, so again, I think that, you know, I think it is important to implicate all of us in these dialogues and to, again, think of it as a point of power. What is the future you want to see? What is the visual culture you want to participate in? Yeah, that, that's a really good point. So we have another question, question five. And I'm not entirely sure if it relates to question four or another question that I asked you earlier, but it does say following up on the last question. Okay. Um, in our current ever more multicultural societies, we inevitably inhabit a visual culture whose meaning we only partially share with others. How does that affect the potential of images and symbols to change? So that's really interesting. I mean, I think, um, I think one thing that it actually demands is that we all become more curious that we all become more sort of interested in um, the unfamiliar and things we don't know and things we don't see. I mean, I also think, and I write about this in the book, I mean, I think one of the things that often disables students, like in the classroom, is just like, they look at a piece, they look at a piece of art or they look at an object and they're like, I don't even know what I should be looking at. I don't even know what I see. I don't see anything. It's just a person standing in a field or whatever, like whatever it is up, or it's just splotches of paint on a canvas. I don't understand what I'm supposed to, what I'm supposed to get out of that. And I think that one thing that I would encourage, that I encourage my students and that I would encourage all of us to do is just a little bit like be nicer to ourselves, not to get all therapeutic about it, but like maybe you're just supposed to stand in front of it and just take it in, just have your own reactions to it. Like maybe you can listen to the object and then listen to yourself and trust yourself to get something out of it. And maybe you're not getting everything out of it. Maybe you don't understand completely all the illusions. Maybe some things evade you in terms of content. But I think that we're a lot more perceptive than we allow ourselves to be. We're a lot more, um, willing to see things that are new and different if we silence the voice that's telling us, you're not smart enough to look at this. You don't know what you're looking at. That's not for you. Um, I think there's a lot of this sense of like alienation from visual culture by everyone. Um, and I think it's a way in which actually powerful people, again, create narratives of that's not for you. That's not your kind of thing. Your kind of person does X, Y, or Z. And it's a way of being divisive. It's a way of keeping people's curiosity shut down. It's a way of blocking people off from, from I think, some images which could give them great joy um, and great pleasure and, and all the good stuff that we want from visual culture, a sense of community, a sense of intimacy, a sense of being part of something. Um, so I guess my, I don't know if this really answers your question, but I think, I, I think I, I want to resist the, I don't know anything, I don't get it, Like you do get it and be open. Um, and I think that it's a struggle for me. I'm not saying that from a position of like, I'm always open. I walk into, you know, galleries, I look at video games and I'm like, nah, -uh, I hate it. Like, <laughs> but be open to hating it and be open to figuring out what you hate about it and what is putting you off and what you might want to see differently. It'll help you, I think, just be open to things in a way that um, is less self-critical and is actually a form of resistance. It's not up to other people to tell you what art, what visual images is for you. Um, you should go out there and take it. I think that is a fantastic message to leave off on. <laughs> um, thank you for sharing that with us. And thank you for coming and talking with us today. Absolutely. It's been a this is super fun. Thank you all so much for coming. And thanks to the crew who did this, um, Nicholas and Zoe and Katie, and of course, Hannah. Um, again, it takes a village to make all of these things happen. And I really appreciate it. Thank you. And just to remind everyone, 
We have um, more information about where to find the book in the chat. We have the link to the book page on our website, um, a blog post with all of the different alternative ways to find books these days, though I'm hoping some bookstores are open and you can buy from your local bookstore as well. Um, and then we also have um, the link to all of our MIT Press Live events and videos. We have the schedule on that link as well as the previous videos. I know a lot of you have been asking for the videos and yes, we do publish videos for every single event um, and they are all on that link. Um, and we will be publishing this video sometime next week. Anyway, thanks again, Alexis. Thank um, you. Thanks everyone else for attending. Bye.